So we all know Game of Thrones loves foreshadowing. Just look at the first image shown from this episode. Right away I knew something was up and feared for the people inside the Great Sept of Baelor. We see the crowd process into the Great Sept and Loras Tyrell is brought to stand trial before the Faith of the Seven. What I loved about this opening is that not a single word is spoken for over four minutes. And the whole time there is this sad piano melody playing instead of talking, which I thought was a great way to foreshadow the events that were to come. So getting back to what actually happened, Grand Maester Pycelle is stopped by one of the little birds, aka a child, and told to come down to the laboratory. In the Great Sept of Baelor, Loras confesses his sins and says that he wants to dedicate his life to the Seven and become a sparrow. So upon hearing this, the others carve their symbol into his head, while elsewhere the king is stopped by the mountain and prohibited from attending the trial. Back in the Great Sept, Queen Marjorie starts to question the whereabouts of Cersei because she's the smartest one there. When the High Sparrow sends Lancel and a couple of other sparrows to go get Cersei, Lancel spots a young kid and starts to follow him down beneath King's Landing. Grand Maester Pycelle arrives at his former laboratory only to find Kyburn and his little birds plotting to kill him. He dies pretty brutally, being stabbed to death, and I thought that the reason they killed him off separately from all the others is because he had some prior knowledge of the wildfire beneath the Great Sept. Lancel is stabbed by one of the little birds upon arriving at the underground stash of wildfire. Back in the Sept, Marjorie expresses her fearfulness of something being amiss. She very correctly says Cersei and Tommen were not there, which puts them in grave danger. She understands the game almost as well as anyone in Westeros, and she absolutely understood the lengths to which Cersei would go to try to get her way. And just as the wildfire is about to go off, the High Sparrow and Marjorie lock eyes, and he understands at just the last second that he totally fucked up and got played by Cersei. And as you saw, a massive wildfire explosion goes off just beneath the Great Sept, vaporizing everyone in there. This was probably the biggest massacre in all of Game of Thrones. Let's go over who was killed in the explosion. First, the High Sparrow, Lancel Lannister, Marjorie Tyrell, Loras Tyrell, Mace Tyrell, Kevon Lannister, and Grand Maester Pycelle was also killed in the same plot. You know, I think it's safe to say that Cersei has finally become a full-fledged psychopath as we see her smile for the first time in a while because she is just so pleased with how it all turned out. Adding on to this, Cersei captures Septu and Ella and pretty much lets her know how fucked she is. But Septu and Ella isn't going to be killed right away, it seems like the mountain is going to have some fun with her. And watching his city burn and knowing his queen Marjorie is dead, Tommen jumps to his death without any hesitation. Coming back to King's Landing, Cersei realizes the prophecy has finally come true, and she shows very little emotion even when presented with Tommen's dead body. I mean, she shed like one or two tears and that was it. Will the king and I have children? <laughs> the king will have twenty children. And you will have three. That doesn't make sense. Gold will be their crowns. Gold. I think that Cersei sort of knew Tommen was going to die in the back of her head because she believed in the prophecy as two of her kids had already died. Um, so the last one wasn't even that big of a shock, especially when you consider the fact that Tommen basically stabbed her in the back. But this is the part of the prophecy that hasn't come true yet. Oh yes, you will be queen for a time. And comes another, younger, more beautiful, to cast you down and take all you hold dear. Now Cersei probably thought that the girl in the prophecy to come and take her throne was Marjorie, but that obviously can't be the case, which, ba which leaves basically one candidate to come and take her throne in season 7, Daenerys Targaryen. It fits perfectly considering the fact that her ships have already set sail for Westeros. And when the witch said that the younger, more beautiful queen will come to take all you hold dear, at first I assumed that she was talking about Cersei's family, but the more I think about Cersei and her true motivations and values, the more I think the witch was talking about Cersei's power and status as everything that she holds dear. Next, Samuel finally arrives at the Citadel in Old Town, and it is pretty damn massive. The guy at the front desk is a huge dick, but he eventually lets Sam into the ultra-massive library. 
One cool thing to note that I found online is that the chandeliers have the same design as the opening logo in the Game of Thrones intro. So back in Winterfell, Davos comes in and tells Jon Snow that Melisandre burned Shireen at the stake to try and save the army. Uh, Mel tries to defend herself, but it's pretty difficult to come up with an excuse, especially when the crime is burning a child alive. Davos calls for her execution, but Jon Snow decides to exile her to the south, telling her never to come north again or she will be executed. After that, Jon thanks Sansa for bringing the Knights of the Vale to their aid, and Sansa apologizes for not telling him the plan. He again stresses the need for tr absolute truth and honesty, especially now that they've reclaimed Winterfell and in the process made a lot of enemies. Lastly, Sansa tells Jon that a White Raven arrived at Winterfell, and as I said in my episode 10 preview, the White Raven signals the start of winter. Next, we go to Dorne where Lady Olena meets with Ilario Sand. Uh, the two are not friends per se, but they share the common goal of getting revenge on the Lannister family and more specifically Cersei. Ilaria rings a bell and out pops Varys, and he will likely broker an alliance between Dorne, the Tyrells, and Daenerys, making them the strongest force in all of Westeros. Speaking of Daenerys, she breaks up with Dario and admits to Tyrion that she did it all without feeling a thing. I feel like this plays perfectly into one of the themes of Season 6, which is woman psychopaths. Think about it for a second. Ilaria Sand murdered King Doran and the Prince. Sansa smiled when Ramsay was being eaten alive. Cersei couldn't contain her grinning when the Great Septa Baylor was being burned with all those people inside. Daenerys didn't feel a thing while breaking up with Dario. And later in the episode, Arya smiles when slitting Lord Walder Frey's throat. I wonder if this theme continues on throughout Season 7, as it really was the first season in which women have arguably played a more dominant and cutthroat role. So like I just mentioned, Arya has turned into an absolute psychopath as she carved up Black Walder and Lothar Frey and fed them to Walder Frey. I'm just glad that she's finally made it back to Westeros and finally had an impact on the main storyline. I really loved this next scene with Sansa. It showed just how much she has grown up since the last time she and Littlefinger were together. Lord Peter Baelish gives a pretty beautiful speech telling Sansa of his dream to have the Iron Throne with her by his side. Then he goes in for the kiss, but Sansa stops him in his tracks and it is a sad moment for Littlefinger. The Stark women just don't like that guy. Because she rejected him, Lord Baelish again tries to get Sansa to turn on Jon by saying that he's not a Stark, he's just a bastard, and that you are more fit to rule than he will ever be. He tried to use the same tactic at Castle Black, but that kind of shit doesn't work on her anymore. Because like I said, she has grown a lot. So up north, Benjen Stark tells Brandon Mira that he must leave them because he cannot pass the wall. Remember that Benjen was stabbed with an ice sword and saved by one of the children of the forest by shoving a piece of dragon glass into his chest. And as soon as Benjen leaves them, Bran spots a weirwood tree and wastes no time going into a vision. And yep, like most people thought, we get to see the last part of the Tower of Joy scene. We see young Ned Stark run up the stairs as he did, as he did in the last vision, and he turns around again and scans the area. Only this time, Bran didn't say anything. This to me was sort of definitive evidence that Bran did not change the past and that young Ned Stark always turned around, no matter what. Or maybe Bran had already changed the past when he called out Father. I don't really know to be honest. Getting back to the main storyline, Ned sees Lyanna in a pool of her own blood from childbirth. She pleads for Ned to protect her child by keeping his identity, by keeping his identity a secret, and it cuts to Jon Snow, and finally, Finally, R plus L equals J has been confirmed. This scene also gave more credence to Jon Snow being a Zor Ahai. Young Ned Stark places Dawn, the sword of Sir Arthur Dane, at Lyanna's bedside. The sword is said to have been forged from the heart of a fallen star, and the prophecy states that a Zor Ahai will be reborn when the Red Star bleeds. They clearly put Dawn next to a pool of Lyanna's blood, and I've said it a million times, everything is intentional in Game of Thrones. Next. The North holds a meeting of all the houses, deciding what to do next. Jon warns everyone of the White Walkers, telling them that they are the real threat to be faced. Lyanna Mormont stands up and gives a great speech telling all the other Northern Lords that Jon Snow is the true King of the North, bastard or not. This in turn gets all the other Lords to declare Jon Snow the King of the North. And the whole scene was eerily similar to Rob's declaration as King of the North. 
And of course, Littlefinger is standing off in the shadows, and he is definitely not participating in the King of the North chant. Cersei is proclaimed Queen of the Seven Kingdoms, and Jaime arrives just in time to see her crowning. He looks so uncomfortable watching her become queen, I wonder if he already knows what went down. Jaime says that Cersei is the love of his life and the only thing he cares about, but I have a feeling he thinks Cersei has gone too far this time. Their last child, Tommen, was killed because of it, and I think it may cause a big rift between them in Season 7. In the final clip of Season 6, Daenerys' army is finally sailing to Westeros, and she has a ton of ships. Literally as far as the eye can see, and on top of all that, three dragons. Cersei is so fucked, and I almost guarantee we'll see her death in the next season. Okay guys, thanks for watching the video. So now that Game of Thrones is over, I will be putting out videos on random topics that, you know, interest me. I'll probably be doing the same thing for Walking Dead since uh, I'm really into that show too. And if you don't want to watch any of those things, then I'll see you next season and I'll be doing the episode breakdowns, the preview breakdowns, and all that stuff. Thanks.